and welcome back uh, to our look at the book of Ephesians, which I'm calling the story of grace. Now, last week, uh, last episode, we look, we took the time to get an overview of this incredible letter that Paul wrote. Now, this letter to the Ephesians is considered to be, along with Romans, uh, among the, the mountain peaks of all scripture. Like I was saying last time, Paul divided this letter into two parts. Chapters one to three describe the gospel story and chapters four to six describe the response in our lives to the gospel story. With the end of chapter six describing what we're up against in, in living out this life, not so much in terms of our own sin, but in terms of spiritual opposition that we're going to encounter along the way. Now, before we get on to that, though, Paul takes us through the gospel story, and it's an amazing true story, the story that makes us realize that we were meant for something. Ephesians teaches us who we are and what we are meant to achieve in life and how to live it out. So Paul starts off recounting the gospel story by talking about four aspects of that story. And we're going to look at those four aspects in in this talk. It's the story of redemption, the story of adoption, the story of predestination, and the story of God's seal. So let's dive in. The whole story of Ephesians is the story of grace. Don't forget, grace is getting what we don't deserve. Mercy, on the other hand, is not getting what we do deserve. So where does Paul start? Well, he starts with the story of redemption. He introduces this letter to the church at Ephesus with the words, this letter is from Paul chosen by God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. Now, of course, we know Paul a saint, the writer of most of the theology in the New Testament, the planter of churches, the person who took the gospel to Europe, a giant of the faith. And so that introduction probably just slides by without creating too much interest. But if you were Paul or anyone who knew him back in his day, this introduction was seismic. It's it's incredible. This man had a past with a capital P. I worked hard and killed men and women who believed as I believe today. I put them in chains and sent them to prison. The head of, uh, the, the head religious leader and the leaders of the people can tell you this is true. I got letters from them to take to our Jewish brothers in the city of Damascus. I was going there to put the Christians in chains and bring them to Jerusalem where they would be beaten, he recounts in Acts chapter 22, verses four to five. And yet now he describes himself as someone chosen by God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. He has a new identity, a new purpose. Now, we're used to seeing Paul in this light, and so it probably doesn't really register as being particularly incredible, but it is the worst of the worst, being picked out, not for punishment, but for redemption. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life, he says in 1 Timothy 1 verse 16. Paul uses himself as an example to explain that the gospel means that anyone, whatever their background, whatever their ethnicity, whoever they are, all are welcome into this amazing relationship with Jesus Christ. Anyone can be adopted into this family and be used powerfully by him. You know, the Greek word for praise is eulogia, which literally means to speak well of. 
It's where we get the word eulogy from, which people give at a funeral. And this was Paul's great discovery that despite how he was in the past, God speaks well of him. God eulogizes him, just like he speaks well of you and me. And if God speaks well of us, shouldn't we speak well of him? Which is what praise essentially is, us speaking well of God, because God speaks well of us. How we praise, that is eulogatos, how we praise God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, eulogesas in Greek, with every spiritual blessing, eulogia, in the heavenly realms, says Paul in Ephesians 1 verse 3. Yeah, I've said it before, but what blows my mind is that God not only loves us, he actually likes us. For me, that just takes it to a whole new realm. He likes us. He chooses to speak well of us. He talks us up to whoever will listen. The story of redemption is not the story of God reluctantly or just solemnly pronouncing pardon upon us like a judge might. It is the story of how of, of, of the, the, that he can't shut up about us. And if he can't shut up about us, should we not find it equally difficult to shut up about him? How we praise God, how we eulogize God, who speaks so well of us using every good word he can think of in the heavenly realms. This is the story of redemption, which leads to us speaking well of him. Now, I've got to ask myself why I why I can't shut up about, say, my grandchildren, who I talk about in glowing terms until people are bored about it, but I find it harder to bring up the subject of Jesus Christ, who has redeemed me. Maybe that's something all of us could do with thinking through a bit. But this is also the story of adoption. We haven't just been redeemed out of, we have been invited into. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes, says verse 4, chapter 1. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, says verse 5. Paul is drawing on the imagery of adoption in the Roman world here. The, the ritual of adoption was an important and an impressive one. It was carried out by a symbolic sail in which copper, coins and scales were used. Twice the real father sold his son and twice he symbolically bought him back. Finally, he sold him a third time and at the third sale, he didn't buy him back. And after this, the adopting father had to go to one of the principal Roman magistrates and plead the case for adoption. Only after all this was done was the adoption complete. And when it was complete, it was absolute. The adopted child had all the rights of a legitimate son in his new family and lost all the rights he previously had in his old family. In the eyes of the law, he was a new person. Even the debts and the obligations connected with his previous family were abolished as if they never existed. This, says Paul, is what God has done for us. Not because he had to, but because he decided to on the basis of his love for us. He is so rich in kindness that he purchased our freedom through the blood of his son and our sins are forgiven. He has showered his kindness on us with all wisdom and understanding, says Ephesians 1 verses 7 and 8. Now that word showered is not a sprinkling, but a drenching, an outpouring of his kindness on us. And what that results in is, is two things, wisdom and understanding. 
Wisdom in Greek is Sophia, which is intellectual knowledge. God wants us to know the truth rather than just be swept along by emotion and and um, uh, religious practices. Understanding in Greek is phronesis, which means the practical knowledge that enables us to handle the day-to-day problems of practical life and living. In other words, coming into a knowledge of God's love sets us free from delusion and fantasy as we come to know Christ who is the truth. And it guides us in our day-to-day living to make right choices and to follow the right path as we allow the counsel of the Holy Spirit free reign in our lives. We'll never be set free from our own fantasies and live our daily lives the way God wants us to until we understand and start living in the knowledge of God's love. And that is precisely what Jesus Christ wants to lead us to. He says, give me full access to your life and I will lead you into all truth. The truth of who God is, of who you are in Christ and of what you were created to achieve in life. In fact, a great community is one where Jesus Christ is given permission to do just that. Not rubber stamp our own agenda but lead us into the truth of God's agenda, which is all about his love for us. He chose us for adoption, not on a whim or to make up the numbers, but out of something far, far deeper. He cannot stop saying good things about us in heaven. And that leads us into the third aspect of the story of the gospel, the story of predestination. This is a story that brings with it a lot of controversy, sadly. But really, because predestination literally means setting out a path before us, the argument isn't really about who gets a path that leads them to heaven and who gets a path that leads them to hell. It's really about the question, will you follow God's path for your life? The plain fact is he chose us. In love, he predestined us for adoption. In other words, in love, he mapped out the best possible path for you and I to not only encounter this life-giving, life-giving relationship with Jesus, but to live redeemed, experiencing his best for our lives. What if we don't agree and instead embark on a different path? What do you mean, what if? We do this all the time, even though we know that God has said, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future, as uh, it says in Jeremiah 29, 11. Even though we are loved and adopted and God has marked out a course for us that will give us the best possible life, we still need to choose to take that path. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, according to his pleasure and will, says Ephesians 1 verse 5. That doesn't take away our free will. It just shows us that the more we conform to his will, the better, the more exciting life gets. You and I are chosen. We are redeemed. We are called this day to choose whom we will serve. That is predestination, and it runs right alongside of free will. One thing to bear in mind about this debate, and indeed about how we approach any and every controversial subject as uh, Christians, is uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. God's secret plans have now been revealed to us. It is a plan centered on Christ, designed long ago according to his good pleasure. And this is his plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. The goal is unity. Unity is not necessarily about seeing everything the same way. 
Unity is about managing to walk hand in hand without necessarily seeing eye to eye. How we handle disagreements is a good test of our maturity in Christ. The story of the gospel is the story of redemption. It's the story of adoption. It's the story of predestination. And also, it's the story of God's seal on our lives, the mark of God on our lives, the promised Holy Spirit. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. That's verses 13 and 14. Now, a seal has two, prom two, two purposes. To the outside world, it marks us as his. To ourselves, it is a deposit reminding us that we have not yet received our full inheritance. Now, you might remember that at various times in the past, I've said that salvation comes in three parts. We are justified, we are sanctified, and we are glorified. In the past, for those who are in Christ Jesus, we were justified. It is immediate upon asking Jesus to be our Lord and Saviour trusting that his death on the cross pays the price for my sin, a price that I could not pay. We are made right with God and forgiven of sin. Sanctification is ongoing. It's the process of being made holy, of being made into the, the shape and the likeness of Jesus. Glorification, this is future tense salvation. What happens in heaven when sin will be gone and we receive our resurrection body? Glorification is amazing, but we need to go through the process of sanctification to get there. And that's what Paul was so aware of and what led him to write in Philippians, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. That's Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. He's talking about the process of salvation, the journey in this life of being made holy or being sanctified. We're not there yet. But we are in the midst of a process and the deposit of the Holy Spirit guarantees that God will not give up on us until we are glorified. Well, he won't give up on us ever, but certainly not before we are glorified. The fruit of the Spirit is becoming more apparent as we work through the process, as we continue on the path that God has marked out for us towards the destination that he's lined up for us. We're not there yet, but we have the glorious promise that as we are in Christ, because we have been justified, we shall get there. As Paul prays, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the wonderful future that he has promised to those he called. I want you to realize what a rich and glorious inheritance he has given to his people. That's verse 18 of chapter one. I want you, I want that for you and me too. I pray that our hearts will be flooded with light and that we would begin to understand the height, the depth, the length and the breadth of God's amazing grace. This is the wonderful gospel story and it's my prayer for, for each of us. So Lord Jesus, would you, graciously open the eyes of our hearts that we may begin to understand as never before just how how wide how high how deep just the length and the breadth of your amazing grace for us your your love for us that you have rescued us that you are in the process of sanctifying us and that you will glorify us one day in heaven. 
Lord, thank you so much for the gospel. Thank you that it has changed, is changing, and will change our lives. Lord, because of you, Jesus, we are redeemed. We are given the Holy Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance. What a wonderful hope awaits us. What a wonderful hope given to us by Jesus through his death on the cross. And Lord, as we go on and look further in uh, the next instalment at this amazing gospel story, Lord, would you open our eyes, open our hearts, open, open us up to your amazing grace as never before. And I pray it for all of us in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope that you can join us next time as we continue to look at this wonderful letter that Paul wrote as we uh, look together at uh, the next chapter, chapter two. So look forward to joining with you again next time. In the meantime, have a blessed and a wonderful week. God bless you.